In part one, we learned the very basics of HLSL and Shader Lab and used them to create an unlit color shader. In part two, we are going to incorporate a texture into our shader so that we can show off more color details than we ever could imagine with just a single color. Then later, I'll scroll the texture over time across the surface of the mesh. A texture is essentially just an image. Usually it is two-dimensional, and the most basic way to apply a texture to a mesh is to just display its colors on the mesh directly. First, we need some textures. You can make them yourself using any image program, or you can grab them from any asset store or somewhere that hosts CC0 textures, which are effectively in the public domain. For CT0 assets, I recommend Ambient CG for PBR texture maps and Kenny for mostly 2D sprites. Next, we need to know how each bit of the texture gets mapped onto the mesh surface. It actually happens the other way around. Meshes have some additional data attached to each vertex called its texture coordinate, which is a 2D position on the texture. When we draw a pixel, we interpolate these coordinates between nearby vertices and then grab the color value from that point on the texture. Conventionally, we name the axes along the texture data U and V instead of X and Y respectively to avoid confusion with other coordinate systems. So texture coordinates are also usually called UVs. It's also worth mentioning that the texture spans the 0 to 1 range along the U and V axes. Unity's primitive meshes like cubes and spheres already have UV set up for you, although sadly it's out of the scope of this series to teach you how to add them to your own meshes. Let's dive into making the shader. Most of the code is going to be identical to the Hello World shader that we wrote in part 1, so I'm going to duplicate it and rename the copy to Basic Texturing. Once you open the shader file, remember to also rename the shader on the first line. Then we need to add a second property to the shader. This time, we'll call it underscore base texture. The type for 2D textures is just 2D, and then we supply a default value. For a white texture, we just say white in quotes or another default value like black, grey, red, or bump for normal mapping. After that, we need to open and close a set of curly braces for some reason, although nothing ever gets put in them. That's it for Shader Lab, so next, we need to add the texture property again within the HLSL program block. We write texture2d in all caps, then put our texture name in parentheses, so base texture in our case. We also need to supply a sampler. The process of reading data from a texture is called sampling, and so a sampler tells the graphics API how to perform each texture sample. When you import a texture, you've probably seen these wrap mode and filter mode settings. A wrap mode tells Unity what to do if you try to sample with UVs outside the usual 0 to 1 range. So we can clamp to the edge of the texture or repeat it. And a filter mode defines what happens when sampling a small region of the texture over a big enough surface. Point filtering uses the nearest pixel on the texture, or we can blend linearly between nearby pixels. A sampler bundles both of those settings together. To use these exact settings as seen on the texture, we prefix the word sampler onto the texture name so sampler underscore base texture, and the unity macro that we use to define it is just sampler in all caps. The final new variable that I want to add here is the tiling and offset of the texture, which are exposed and changeable on many materials. It is a float for, and we use the texture name with underscore st on the end, which stands for scaling and translation. So here, it's underscore base texture, underscore st. Next, let's read those texture coordinates from the mesh. We feed them into the vertex shader alongside the vertex position in the app data struct. This time, it's a float2, which we can just name uv, and the corresponding semantic is text coord0. Meshes can have multiple uv channels, which we can read with different numbers like 
text chord 1, text chord 2, and so on. But the zero UV usually contains regular UVs for texture sampling. We will be doing the sampling in the fragment shader, so the V2F strut will also need its own entry for the UVs, which will use the same text chord zero semantic. But first, the vertex shader needs to read the vertex UVs and pass them to the fragment shader. We can just set the output UVs equal to the input UVs, but I want to take the texture's tiling and offset into account. For that, Unity provides a macro called transform underscore text, which applies the values in that st variable to the UVs. We pass in the input UVs and the texture name into this macro. When the rasterizer creates pixels from our vertices, it also takes the UVs attached to those vertices and interpolates them. Essentially, a pixel halfway between two vertices gets a UV coordinate halfway between the UV of those vertices. Finally, we can sample the texture inside the fragment shader. We use another macro called sample underscore texture 2D and pass in the texture, its sampler, and the set of UV coordinates we're using. This returns a float for color value. We can then mix this color with the existing base color property by multiplying both values and return the result. Now, when we return to the scene view, we can create a few new materials and assign different textures to them to see what the shader is doing. We are able to modify the tiling and offset of the materials to map the texture differently across the surface of the mesh. Or we can change the value of base color to see how it looks when it's blended with the base texture. Our shader is now functional, but I want to go on a bit of a side quest before we talk about scrolling textures. When Unity created URP and HDRP, they had the opportunity to optimize the low-level rendering code, resulting in the SRP Batcher, which tries to reduce draw calls and costly data transfers from the CPU to the GPU where possible. However, we need to modify our shaders to make them compatible with the SRP Batcher. Anything that we declare in both the Properties block and the HLSL needs to exist in a special constant buffer in HLSL. We start the buffer with cbuffer underscore start and pass in the name of the buffer, which is unity per material. Then we end the buffer with cbuffer underscore end, and that's it. As long as those properties are sandwiched between those macros, then we'll have SRP Badger compatibility. Textures work differently, and we can leave those outside the buffer. Back in Unity, we can easily see if a shader supports SRP Badger by clicking on it. Our basic texturing shader supports it, but Hello World from Part 1 does not, since we never added that buffer to it. There's a helpful message telling you what broke compatibility. We can quickly see the practical difference using the frame debugger, which we can open via Window Analysis Frame Debugger. When you click Enable, it lists every draw call made during each frame, and can show us what the screen texture looks like after each call. In my scene, I have some cubes using Hello World and others using basic texturing. Under Draw Opaque Objects, you'll see Draw and Draw SRP Batcher. Under Draw, there are several calls, and when you click each one, you'll see a single Hello World cube being drawn one at a time. The basic texturing cubes, on the other hand, use the SRP Batcher, so they all appear at once in one draw call. Neat, right? Anyway, that's the side quest over but I'm going to be using the SRP Batcher in shaders from now on, so I wanted to explain what it does. Next, let's scroll the texture over time. I want to leave the basic texturing shader alone, so I'll duplicate it and then name the copy Scrolling Textures. I'll also remember to rename the shader on the first line. This shader is going to need another property to control how far the texture gets scrolled over time, called underscore scroll speed. This property will use the vector type, because I want to use different speeds for the horizontal and vertical directions. The property declaration for vector types is very similar to color types, 
with four parameters for the default value. But the annoying thing is that you need to declare all four, even if you don't intend to use all of them. I'll make the default value zero for each component. In HLSL, we can then declare the property again inside the C buffer, but this time, we can use float2 as the type because we only need to use the X and Y components. Let's use this property in the fragment shader. The UV we use to sample the texture are a 2D vector, and the scroll speed is also a 2D vector, so it's possible to add them together into a new UV variable, although it won't do anything over time by itself. We can get the amount of time that's passed since the game started using the underscore time variable, which is available to every shader. It actually has four components. The Y component gives you the number of seconds since the game started. Then the X component is 1 20th of that, Z is 2 times it, and W is 3 times it. I stick with underscore time dot y for many of my shaders, which I'll do here by multiplying it with scroll speed. I'll point out here that when we multiply a scalar value like time dot y with a vector, we multiply each component of that vector with the scalar value and get a vector result. Then I can use my uv variable instead of the input uvs when sampling. And now we have a shader which can scroll textures over time. Back in the scene view, I have set up a few cubes to use this shader. By default, the scroll speed on each one is zero, but if we increase it, then the textures will start to swim across the mesh surfaces. If you don't immediately see this, there are a couple of possible solutions. First, if the scrolling movement is jittery, Try using this dropdown above the scene view and enable the always refresh option. Second, if you don't see a texture at all, then the source texture asset might have its wrap mode set to clamp. If you change it to repeat, then you should see the texture properly. There is another way to solve that second problem inside the shader. I'll set this texture's wrap mode back to clamp. Then, in the scrolling texture shader, I'll import a second file this time from the Unity's core SRP shader library rather than URP, called Global Samplers. This is quite a small file, here it is in its entirety, and all it does is define a few reusable samplers with common settings that we can use on our shaders instead of using, say, sampler underscore base texture as we did previously. So when we sample the texture, I'll use sampler underscore linear repeat which forces the shader to use linear filtering and repeat wrap mode, no matter what the import settings my textures use. Using these samplers instead of the ones attached to textures gives you the power to do things like only using point filtering in a pixelation shader, for example. It's good to know that it's an option you always have available. So far, I've been following the progression of the Shader Graph Basics series, so in the next part of this series, we'll take a look at using transparency in shaders. Until next time, have fun making shaders.